This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Well, as the United States becomes increasingly diverse and the Democratic Party even more so, the presidential nomination process remains heavily weighted by two states that are among the whitest in the nation, Iowa and New Hampshire. During the first-ever presidential forum on environmental justice earlier this month in South Carolina, I asked Senator Elizabeth Warren about the issue. Senator Warren, just 30 seconds left. But speaking about racial injustice, do you think the order of the primary state should change? You have Iowa and New Hampshire. Wait, let, they, me, let me just, before you finish, are you actually going to ask me to sit here and criticize Iowa and New Hampshire? <laughs> no, I'm asking about the order. No, that is what Iowa but, and New but Hampshire But let me just about. ask. They're two of the whitest states in the country. And then we moved to South Carolina with a, um, a very significant significant uh, population of people of color. And it means the candidates spend so much of their time catering to those first two states. Overall, do you think that should change? Look, I'm just a player in the game on this one. And I am delighted to be in South Carolina. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You, Senator Warren's reaction to the question echoes the Democratic Party's stance on maintaining first-in-the-nation status for both the Iowa caucus and the New Hampshire primary. In 1972, Iowa Democrats moved the caucus up to January 24th to give themselves extra time to process the results from all the precincts. That early date made the Iowa caucus's nation's first indicator of each candidate's standing attracted extraordinary media attention. The Iowa Democratic and Republican parties agreed to hold their caucuses early and on the same day to maximize national press coverage. New Hampshire then cemented its hold as the first primary state immediately following the Iowa caucuses. Candidates in some cases spend more time, uh, more than a year, making frequent extended campaign swings through Iowa and New Hampshire, which critics say gives the concerns of these first two states disproportionate impact on the agenda for the entire race. MSNBC played my exchange with Warren for Democratic presidential hopeful Julian Castro, who pushed back on the status quo. I actually believe that um, that we do need to change uh, the order of the states, because I don't believe that, uh, that we're the same country we were in 1972. That's when Iowa first held its caucus first. And by the time we have the next presidential election in 2024, it'll have been more than 50 years since 1972. Our country has changed a lot in those 50 years. Uh, the Democratic Party has changed a lot. What I really appreciate about Iowans and the folks in New Hampshire is that they take this process very seriously. Mm -hmm. They vet the candidates, they show up at town halls, they give people a good hearing. At the same time, demographically, it's not reflective of the United States as a whole, certainly not reflective of the Democratic Party. And I believe that other states should have their chance. Uh, so yes, of course, we need to find other states uh, and that doesn't mean that Iowa and New Hampshire can't still play an important role. Right. But I don't believe that forever we should be married to Iowa and New Hampshire going first. In another interview with CBS, Julian Castro said, quote, we can't say to black women, oh, thank you, you're the ones powering our victories in places like Alabama in 2018, and then turn around and start our nominating contests in two states that barely have any black people in them. That doesn't make sense. But Castro won't be raising this issue at, the, at Wednesday's debate in Atlanta. He didn't make the cut for this debate. In a moment, we'll be joined by uh, Gilberto Hinojosa, chair of the Texas Democratic Party. But first, we turn to Ian Milheiser, senior correspondent at Vox. Ian, welcome back to Democracy Now! How did this system um, happen? Uh, who created this system that two of the whitest states in the country are the first in the primary system? And now, with the extended well, pre-primary season, all of these candidates spend this time in Iowa and New Hampshire. Well, I mean, as you alluded to in the intro, this wasn't something done with intentionality. You, you, you know, no one in the Democratic Party sat down and said, what are the two states that would be best to start off the, the, the process? It's just that Iowa and New Hampshire, you know, jockeyed themselves to the front of the line at a time when the media started paying a lot of attention to the early races. And now that they have it, you know, the, the, the psychological term is loss aversion. When you have something it's very you, you you get very upset if someone tries to take it away from you and and that's the problem with this dynamic is that there was never any planning there was never any thought that put into well who makes sense to be the first state 
And then once you get someone in that position, they're going to be very, very resistant if someone tries to um, assign that position to someone else. Well, we're also joined by Gilberto Hinojosa, chair of the Texas Democratic Party. Uh, welcome to Democracy Now! Could you talk to us about what the impact on a, a huge state like Texas, your state is, by the fact that the candidates are so focused uh, in the in uh, so, for so much time on Iowa and New Hampshire? Well, I mean, it's obvious. I mean, Texas is the second largest state in the country. It is probably the most diverse state in the country. Forty percent of the population in the state is Hispanic. Fifteen percent is either African American or Asian American. We are a majority minority state, as is California and New Mexico. And yet, you know, we have to wait uh, until the process in Iowa and in New Hampshire uh, completes itself. And, and uh, uh, Secretary Castro is, is correct. Uh, you know, these are not two states. States that are are, are representative uh, in terms of ethnicity uh, of the of the Democratic Party. I mean, it's like I'm from the Rio Grande Valley of Texas. There's about 1.4 million people that live in the Rio Grande Valley. They're about it's about 90 percent Latino. It's like if we would have our primary in the Rio Grande Valley of Texas and make and have candidates spending three months there continuously going to uh, 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 barbecues and different events that were being sponsored by the local elected officials. Nobody would think that that would be representative, uh, a representative primary that you would have to start your election season with. And, and, and so I, I think this is a process that has been established through tradition. Uh, tradition doesn't work anymore. Um, uh, I think it's not fair to the candidates either. I mean, they spend an enormous amount of time and money. I mean, you know, the people go to uh, uh, a, a big dinners there. Candidates go there. They have to put their supporters in the dinners. They have to pay for the supporters to be there. They end up spending thousands of dollars um, uh, uh, to to get the attention in this small state of Iowa that um, that that doesn't produce the results that is. Uh, are reflective of what our Democratic Party uh, represents all across America. So I think it's a it's something that should change. At least we have to have a conversation. I've been on the Democratic National Committee for 10 years or longer than that, and we've never had a conversation on this issue. We've never talked about whether or not Iowa and New Hampshire should be the first prim uh, first primaries. We were always told this is the way it is, and 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 you just kind of have fact, to deal with it. In fact, the DNC chair, Tom Perez, um, uh, uh, made a deal with the Iowa delegation uh, that he would not challenge their first status uh, if they voted for him to be chair of the D DNC. Um, but I wanted to ask you, you told the New York Times, uh, Gilberto Hinojosa, that you're trying to host a forum in January. You have trouble attracting a lot of the presidential candidates because they say they're too busy in Iowa. Well, in fact, we would like to have a forum with all the candidates, and and in Iowa, they're having a forum at the exact same time, and therefore the question is: Are you going to right before the caucuses? Are is a candidate going to come to Texas that has you know uh, the the 38 electoral votes and has a heck of a lot more delegates going to the national convention, uh, or are you going to go to Iowa that has a small number of of of, of delegates and and electoral votes? Um, uh, which is going to produce the most results for you? Well, because Iowa is first, people are going over there instead of this state uh, that has much more potential for, especially, you know, uh, second uh, tier, at least in terms of uh, where they're being rated, candidates. I mean, um, I, I just think it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't help us uh, flush out the whole process to where we could get uh, a, a candidate that has a better chance of winning uh, in November. And I just think that, you know, we've never had this conversation before, and, and it's very frustrating for for us. I mean, we have uh, we're a state that is, is is clearly purple now. It has been declared uh, to be a battleground state. Um, if Texas were to turn blue, um, it would be all over for the Republican Party's ability to elect a president of the United States because we have so many electoral votes. Yet we're being placed, you know, behind these other states uh, and not given an opportunity to 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 get these candidates in the state to compete in the state and to be able to come out with a delegate. 
delegates that help them uh, go in the direction of, of being able to get the nomination. I'd, I'd like to ask uh, uh, Ian Milheiser the uh, this whole issue of whether this is the way it is and it can't be changed. Uh, talk about the, the, some of the history. We only have about a minute and a half left, but there's always been a battle over how these primaries right. uh, selection process occurs. And it actually was after the 1968 Democratic Convention when Hubert Humphrey won the nomination without winning a single primary. Uh, that ma a lot of the major changes have occurred. Right. Yeah. I mean, the, the modern system where primaries actually matter is fairly new and, and was created and it was created in the 70s. Um, the uh, the issue here, well, I'll tell one particular piece of history. And this is in 2004, Howard Dean was the front runner for most of that Democratic primary. And then shortly before the Iowa caucuses began, a video clip emerged of him criticizing the Iowa caucus from before he was even a presidential candidate. And that was when the momentum shifted. I mean, I don't know if there's a causal relationship there or not, but I do know that that clip was played constantly on, on in Iowa media. He was attacked relentlessly for it, and he wound up taking third. So if you are a presidential candidate, you know, I don't blame Elizabeth Warren for being evasive, evasive about things because Iowa will punish you. If, if, if you come after that first in the in the nation status and it's a problem because it's not good for the Democratic Party to have this one up unrepresented state cons unrepresentative state constantly be first so you in now, line. So you now have Julian Castro, who's not going to make it to tomorrow night's debate. The top four candidates are all white, right. yet there is a diverse group of candidates for the Democratic Party. At the start of October, the Charleston Post and Courier found Buttigieg had no black voter support in South Carolina, just 4 percent support overall. But now this poll shows he is almost 10 percent ahead of all other candidates in Iowa. Right. Now, I mean, I will caution about that poll. I'm old enough to remember when Herman Cain was the front runner for the Republican nomination. So there's often, when you see a lot of movement in the polls, it just means that people are undecided. But yes, I mean, Buttigieg is a candidate who seems to appeal very well to the white electorate in Iowa. We're going to have to leave it there. Ian Milheiser, senior correspondent for Vox, and Gilberto Hinojosa, chair of the Texas Democratic Party. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Stream Democracy Now's impeachment coverage at democracynow.org.